uh, recognizing the difficulties that have been imposed on Palestinian people living in refugee camps uh, or uh, under occupation or in Gaza. And I was very struck in talking with uh, Palestinian refugees in Jordan about a year ago uh, that what the women there were particularly and uniformly interested in was not the peace process or some kind of solution. They were more realistic, in my view, uh, than the quote-unquote experts. What they were interested in was improving the daily lives of the people they loved and cared about. Improving health, education, job opportunities, uh, in the situation they confronted. And th therefore, I think this uh, notion of trying to address the suffering, the existential suffering of the Palestinian people is itself an empowering initiative. And there is an example of what uh, an American NGO has been trying to do. An interesting example is, is something called Playgrounds for Palestine which is a small group in Philadelphia that has been gathering funds to uh, construct playgrounds in the occupied uh, territories. And it's, it's a symbolic initiative, but it's also substantively meaningful to the people that are uh, experiencing it. And so what, uh, and the third, element of creating the political preconditions is to uh, encourage in every way possible a, the emergence of a unified, inclusive, and uh, authoritative Palestinian leadership. That is indispensable, in my view, to, to moving in any uh, way uh, toward a uh, positive outcome. I realize that this is a uh, discouraging message to emphasize the prematurity of proposing a solution after 65 years uh, since the Nakba of dispossession uh, occurred. But at the same time, it seems to me that it recognizes the situation that exists and tries to create the most uh, positive potentiality uh, for the future and draws on this extraordinary Palestinian strength of uh, resilience, a, uh, a, a capacity that uh, for uh, maintaining a strong sense of uh, joy in life despite the, in the mid the suffering, one has to experience this uh, Palestinian quality uh, to uh, appreciate its depth and, in my view, its longer term uh, political relevance. I want to end with some lines uh, from uh, at Susan Abelhawa's novel, uh, Mornings in Janine, which I highly recommend to all of you that uh, haven't read it. It's the most uh, captivating account of the pa Palestinian narrative from the time of the Nakba, and it's done with uh, appropriate empathy for the uh, Israeli Jewish narrative as well. It's a very uh, uh, profound uh, effort in, in many ways to achieve in literature uh, what uh, statesmen and uh, academic experts can't, can't do. And I just want to read the lines of, that she ends the uh, book with, the novel with, uh, which, which stress this link between uh, Palestinian Sumud and the retention of love at the core of one's being. And these are her lines. Sometimes time is immobile, 
like a corpse, and I lie with it in my bed. And there I sleep, waiting for the honorable thing to come of its own accord. For I'll keep my humanity, though I did not keep my promises, and love shall not be wrested from my veins. I find this vision at once enigmatic, yet very powerful. Thank you very much. Dr. Falk for this uh, thought-provoking uh, joke. And uh, we move now to questions and answers. Uh, may I ask you if you could kindly make your questions as brief as possible so that we could give the chance to as many people as possible to ask questions.
civil society it, 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 in the last few years uh, in a significant way. Uh, it isn't changing in Washington. Uh, and if anything, uh, Obama is more timid about this conflict in his second term, despite Netanyahu campaigning for his opponent in the last presidential election, than he was in his first term, because he doesn't want this issue to interfere with his pursuit of the domestic priorities that he believes, I think, that his legacy depends on. There was one article in the uh, Economist last month, basically uh, talking, talking about the uh, modern. Uh, uh, sorry, we can't hear you. Can you raise your voice? Okay. <coughs> there was a, a uh, is that not enough? <laughs> uh, there was a long article in the Economist last month about uh, a solution that was modeled after the uh, apartheid situation. In South Africa, and they cited several uh, Jewish scholars and uh, professors and leaders uh, describing the same uh, situation. Uh, your comment? Dr. Falk is not sure he understood your question. Could you kindly repeat the question? <laughs> it was like an, an article last month in the economics that describe the solution, not of a two-state solution, but a one-state uh, after the South African model, and cited several Jewish leaders and, uh, and professors and thinkers. I was wondering about your comment. Well, I, first, I'm not familiar with the economist uh, article, but uh, as with the two-state solution, there are versions of uh, various versions of the one-state uh, solution. Uh, the uh, Israeli version is, of course, completing the process of annexation, essentially, <coughs> absorbing the West Bank, uh, retaining Jerusalem, and trying to forget about Gaza and hoping that uh, uh, Egypt will take over. Gaza. That would help solve the so-called demographic problem of Israel. How does it make, remain a democracy if a majority of its population is Palestinian? So without the 1.7 million Gazans, that problem becomes uh, less uh, severe. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, many Palestinian intellectuals have long favored a democratic secular unified uh, Palestine. And uh, it is, uh, in many ways, the only outcome that's consistent with human rights. One of the things that's forgotten is the 20% uh, Israeli population that is Palestinian. It's a race from the diplomacy on the conflict. You never hear that minority which has been discriminated against ever since uh, Israel was established in 1948, you never hear its future as an element of a just and sustainable peace. Uh, and the, the one way to overcome that issue is to create a unified secular state with equal rights for everyone. That's uh, abstractly the most attractive outcome. The problem is it, it would require the abandonment of Zionism as a uh, political project uh, of the Israeli, uh, you know, 95% of Israel, Israel. Uh, and uh, again, couldn't, uh, it, it is no uh, political imaginary that would get us from where we are to that that place, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an impossible trajectory, and therefore, in my view, it suffers again from this uh, premature 
uh, assertion of solutions when the political preconditions haven't been satisfied. See, that's the main uh, thesis that I've been trying to support, is that for the sake of the Palestinians, and even for the sake of those Israelis that seek peace rather than domination, you have to satisfy these political preconditions uh, before any kind of meaningful solution can be uh, uh, embodied in a political process. And that hasn't happened. And there's been a kind of a mind game created ever since Oslo in 1993 where there's the kind of uh, imagery of a solution, but none of the political will to make it happen. And after these 20 years, uh, those that support a just and sustainable peace should wake up to this experience and not perpetuate it. Next question. Uh. Uh, Doctor uh, Folk, you, you uh, drew a parallel between uh, uh, Israel, Palestine, and South Africa, uh, but there is a basic difference here. About I mean, where one difference is racial, the other is religious, and especially after the uh, it has been declared a Jewish uh, Israel has been declared a Jewish state. I mean, the the religious difference which has been also echoed on the other side. Would you think this is a more difficult situation or the racial models? No, I'm, not, I'm glad you, you asked that question because I uh, didn't take the time to explain just precisely the fact that the two situations are significantly different uh, for, uh, for the reasons you suggest. Uh, but what I was trying, why I was uh, trying to emphasize the uh, South African uh, experience was that it showed the uh, importance of a satisfying political preconditions, and that unless, until that happened, until Mandela was released from prison, there was no point pretending as if. Uh, the white elite that was administering apartheid was interested in a just, sustainable, multiracial society. They were dogmatically opposed to it and, and actually considered it a form of terrorism to advocate what they eventually agreed to uh, bring into being uh, with the cooperation of de Klerk and Mandela. Uh, and what I wanted to ex express by that is that before Mandela's release, a solution was based on a politics of impossibility. After his release, it became possible. And that's, what the, that's why the satisfying these political preconditions seems to me so essential. Um, first of all, thank you for coming to Beirut. Um, my name is Martin Bielisch. I'm a research fellow here at the UPAD San Paris Institute. Um, you touched briefly on the role of international organizations like the General Assembly, like UNESCO, and you missed to um, elaborate a little bit more on an organization you are serving in, which is the United Nations Human Rights Council. So I was wondering whether you could, could be step back from your role as a special rapporteur and reflect a little bit about the lessons learned, challenges, but particularly also the missed opportunities, you know, with those opportunities uh, from your personal experience. Thank you for that. Uh, well, it's a, of course a, a difficult question to do uh, real justice to. Uh, maybe I can uh, briefly uh, uh, respond by referring to the Goldstone Report on the criminal accountability of uh, Israel and Hamas for what took place in Gaza in 
And it shows both the strength and weakness of the Human Rights Council. The strength was it was able to create this initiative uh, despite the objection of the United States and the geopolitical forces that are operative within the UN. But it was not able to implement the recommendations of the Goldstone Report because at that stage, the geopolitical forces control what the UN can and cannot do. So the UN is vitally important to what I was calling the legitimacy war, the symbolic struggles for uh, recognition and support that go on in international society. But it's not capable of implementing uh, those uh, legitimacy outcomes unless it has the support of the main geopolitical actors, and that, in this context, means the United States. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, broader question. I mean, sometimes the UN is too strong, arguably, as it was in authorizing the Libyan intervention early 2011, because there the geopolitical forces wanted it to act and wanted to use the authorization to legitimate their use of force. But when they don't want it to act, it's helpless to undertake action. And that's part of the constitutional structure of the UN, and it's true of the Human Rights Council in all parts of the UN. And it's epitomized by the veto power given to the five permanent members of the Security Council. The veto power essentially says, these states don't have to do anything they don't want to do, despite the UN Charter and international law. It is a, a free, a free ride for the five winners in World War II, essentially. And we're still living with that constitutional arrangement within the UN. And it's expressed in different ways in different parts of the UN, including the Human Rights Council.